how do we, oh, there's so much information, and some of you, I see especially those who are oh, students, taking notes, they're writing as fast as they can with the little, uh, they could with the little pencils, and they, they can't get enough in, and so well, how do I get this information? We want you to know that in, uh, very shortly, we will have all of the presentations on our YouTube channel on our website. So, you just, you just, you just, you just go up in there, Click a few things, and for those of you who are teachers, it's a great opportunity to share and teach your classes. So we're expanding such that, I mean, you know, once you hit the internet, that's absolutely worldwide the same day. So we, have, we, we will be teaching people and having this conversation around the world. So in terms of, of, of pragmatics of reconciliation, this is one thing that we can do to affect change. Make sure that the stories that we tell, the, the, the words that we learn, we can actually spread it abroad in a way that is functional. Now, this is, this, I, I'm, so I, I'm, 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 Dr. Warren said it's getting better, better and better. Better, <laughs> better and better. And this, is, this is the last session, and I'm, I'm so excited about it because, um, because, what y'all talking about, this conversation? Look at him, look at him, look at him, look at him. Dr. Erskine, uh, 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 Brother Davis. Brother Davis, Dr. Erskine, you all having this rich conversation. <laughs> all right. Uh, what was I talking about? Is that for? Yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, Dr. 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 Warren has said many times how I call him the seer, the prophet. Not just because of his tremendous dreadlocks, but in terms of his mind and his, and his four forward march and foresight of what needs to be done and the conversation needs to be had. So we sit and we spend a lot of time going through who is going to speak, who is going to represent, who's the, not just, who's the best possible person. Let's go after them. And if a person says no, well, what do you say? So if they say no one time because they're busy, that's, some, that's okay. The second time, that's okay. That's too many times. We're not asking again. And, and we're not offering $25,000. And some people say, well, we, we take $25,000 to get here. And we say, well, thank you very much. We still appreciate your response. And we move on to the next person. And, 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 we, and then whoever that next person is is the one that is supposed to be here. Because we have never been let down. So we're very excited about that. But here, but, but the persons today, it's so exceptional because we've been having this conversation from the time I stepped on the ground about the father of this, this, this beautiful scholar who's about to present. And no one better to represent the, uh, in terms of response than Dr. Than Dr. Um, Warren. Now it would have been, I had, I had the option, should I respond to Dr. Erskine or should I respond to Dr. Peter Paris? Um, I said, you know what, responding to Dr. Erskine is too easy, so like mine, but I really want to respond to Dr. Peter Harris because we're both, we're both ethicists of, of um, different traditions, so I want to say that will turn out and it turned out extremely well. Now, our two presenters today will be presented by our, a particular uh, 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 student moderator, Bioethics Honor Student Moderator. Like Janita, who, who represented yesterday, um, Daniel Dotson, last year, she was not even in the program, but she was present more than many students who are in the program. And that, that is the kind of thing that excites us when students want to be here, want to be a part of bio, on, bioethics honors program, who want to participate in it. And she was here, she was doing both the mic, she was outside of registration, she was all over the place, and I said, this is who we need to have. Also, when we looked around in, at the CDC in Atlanta, who was to show up but <laughs> Daniel Dodson, Janita um, Murray. And we're going to show up this time again, the same too. So she's here because she's an honor student, but she's also someone who is deeply participatory in the whole program that we're offering here. So right now, let us have a hand clap for Daniel Dodson from Compton. <laughs> Chazelle. She manages engagement and research fellowships at Project Drawdown. In that role, she connects individuals and organizations who share the goal of reversing global warming through collaboration. 
Crystal brings interdisciplinary background in law, environmental science, and business management to Project Drawdown. She has advised a range of organizations, including small businesses, the City of Baltimore, and the Maryland Environmental Service. As served as mayor of the town of Highland Beach, Maryland, she has worked at the University of San Francisco and Bay Area Arts Organization. Crystal holds a JD from the University of Maryland School of Law and MS in Environmental Science from Johns Hopkins University, and an MBA from the University of San Francisco and a BA in Journalism from Howard University. Now let's give a warm welcome to Ms. Chazelle. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Dr. Warren and Dr. Hodge for inviting me. Um, I'm here not to present my own work, but my father's work, Dr. John Giselle. He has now joined the ancestors, but I feel his presence in the room as well as the presence of other ancestors. So let's just take a moment to say Ashe. Ashe. So this is Dr. John Giselle. Um, he was born in Charlottesville, Virginia in 1926, raised in Alexandria, Virginia. He graduated from Virginia State College in 1950. Now his initial career ambition was to be an engineer. Um, but that changed during the summer um, while he was in college that he spent working with the federal government in a department that employed engineers. And he observed that the black engineers there were not only working beneath their skills, but they were also in the position of training white engineers who were then promoted above them. Mm -hmm. So this, um, this and other experiences of racism really were formative for him. Um, so he instead followed his father and brother into the medical profession. Um, he graduated from the Harry Medical College in 1954. He practiced medicine in Baltimore for 32 years. Um, during that time, he treated thousands of patients in an underserved area of Baltimore, never turning away any patients, often working until late in the night. He was committed to excellence in the practice of medicine um, and also to acquiring as much knowledge as possible so that he could be an excellent practitioner. Now, the American Board of Family Medicine was founded in 1969 as the certifying body to designate uh, those physicians in the U.S. who are specialists in family medicine. They held the first certifying exams in um, 1970, and Dr. Chiselle was among the physicians who were the first to be designated as specialists in family medicine in the U.S. as a chartered diplomat of the American Board of Family Medicine. Um, because of the ways that he was affected by racism, um, he devoted himself to not only excellence in the care he provided, but also equity in medical care. And as a result, he joined many, many medical, um, both national and um, local medical associations held and held leadership, leadership roles. <coughs> he became the first black president of the Maryland Academy of Family Physicians in 1970. Um, a story that he would always tell that has become part of our family uh, folklore is that when that he insisted that the Maryland Academy of Family Physicians would hold their meetings only at hotels and other venues that would admit black people to stay there or dine there. Um, he often tells the story of integrating um, a hotel on the eastern shore of Maryland called the Tidewater Inn. Um, he tells the story of how when he drove up, um, they, he, the valets at the front asked him, where is Dr. Giselle? <laughs> and so he let them know, I'm Dr. Giselle, and I'm staying here. <laughs> at breakfast, 
um, the next morning, he said he was waited on by just a parade of black servers who each wanted to bring him something, a part of his breakfast, as the first black person to stay at the hotel. Now, I also bring up that story because in part of the internet research I did to prepare for today, I looked at the website of the Maryland Academy of Family Physicians, and they have a page with their history, and interestingly enough, um, they actually claim credit for this policy and say that, say that it, we were very determined that all of our members would be treated equally and we insisted that we would only use for facilities where our black members could stay. And I thought, oh, I think you left out a little bit of that story. <laughs> Now, this is a long list of the many associations, uh, only a partial list of the associations and committees that Dr. Chassel served on. I don't expect you to uh, read that whole um, list, but I just want to make the point that he was sought after for his wisdom and leadership and his integrity. Now, as you know, As you know, after the Tuskegee scandal was revealed, uh, the federal government, Congress established the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects in 1974. In order to get the perspective of black people for their work, they held the National Minority Conference on Human Experience, Experimentation during three days in January 1976. So that was the bulk of the input of black um, physicians. Um, Dr. Giselle um, organized and moderated three of the workshops on healthcare delivery that were presented during that conference. And he also um, served as a consultant to the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare and the FDA on the maximum allowable cost of drugs. So now, racism was not just a social issue, social justice issue to Dr. Chisel, it was also a health issue. This is an article from the New York Times um, in 1989. It's about a symposium held at the annual meeting of the National Medical Association. And here you'll see that Dr. Chisel was quoted as saying, we live in an intensely racist society that teaches us to hate ourselves. But he also said we are studying these issues and coming up with solutions. Now, in his youth, Dr. Giselle developed a life-threatening illness, which was malignant hypertension. He, it, um, what he found was that even though he had studied medicine, sought continuing ed education in medicine, and he had diligently devoted himself to postgraduate study, nothing that he learned in all of that training had prevented him from getting sick. He had, so um, as a result of his own illness, he devoted himself to years of study of the cause and effect of illness in general, and also sought after treatments for his own condition. He read thousands of books in the process about healing. He often says that he had an attack of common sense, <laughs> meaning he, he realized that it was not a congenital lack of high blood pressure medicine that made him sick. So what he did was he began to look for um, cures um, based on lifestyle. He progressively changed his diet from the southern diet he had grown up with, one heavy in red meat to eventually over a two year period converting to a vegan diet. He quit smoking, he began to exercise daily, he established a regular meditation practice and eventually cured his hypertension. So this experience, the many years that he spent of study um, on information that was not generally available, um, that was outside conventional medical practice, led him to bring this, um, this knowledge and wisdom to his <coughs> patients 
and also to strive for what toward optimal health. So, so in 1984, he retired from his clinical practice to pursue full-time what he said was his major purpose in life, to study, model, motivate, and teach the principles of optimal health. Now, this represents a shift in perspective from the work of his early career, from a top-down sick care system to proposing a bottom-up wellness system for optimal health, teaching people to take control of their own health. This is how he defined optimal health. Optimal health is a state of aliveness in which the person is constantly moving and striving toward the best possible emotional, intellectual, physical, spiritual, and socioeconomic state of being that one can attain. In 1993, Dr. Chiselle published Pyramids of Power, and this book documents his approach to optimal health. This book uh, is centered on, first, why, why we should make the effort to move toward optimal health, and second, how to move toward <coughs> optimal health. It presents an approach to optimal health which has the wisdom of ancient African civilizations as its foundation. It's a, a wisdom based on connection to the self, connection to nature, and it's really characteristic of, of most, if not all, indigenous approaches. So it gives um, the reader suggestions for how to move toward optimal health. But more importantly, it's about an empowering way of thinking and behaving. And the essence of this Pyramids of Power approach is empowerment. It's meant as a method for attaining your greatest potential and highest good. That's the bottom line of optimal health, moving toward your greatest potential and um, highest good. So it's, um, it's beyond just being free of disease or having an average level of health. It's about moving toward optimal health. And this approach places not only the responsibility for reaching optimal health, in, but also the power to do so in the hands of the individual. Now, why should we care about moving toward optimal health? The ancient African cosmology that inspired Dr. Chiselle taught that the divine creative energy that created all energy and matter in the universe is present in every living thing. And this God force is beyond the description of human beings in its power, magnificence, and potential. Each of us has our personal spark of the creator, and this is why we need to both know ourselves and love ourselves. Another reason to make the effort. Your health is your greatest asset, Dr. Giselle said worthy of the expenditure of your time, your energy, your money, and your sacrifice. So true health care is your own responsibility. Now, Dr. Chissell was a systems thinker, so he recognized that there are no isolated parts working independently, not in the body and not in the community or in the universe. All things are interconnected, and this is an ancient truth that he adhered to. So the book talks about optimal intellectual health, optimal emotional health, optimal, optimal physical health, optimal spiritual health, and optimal socioeconomic health. Now, Dr. Chiselle uses graphics in the, throughout the book um, to represent um, his points. Um, these are the pyramids of power. And this, is, this um, slide shows the format for interpreting those um, <coughs> graphics that you'll see in the book. So the black capstone at the top of the pyramid represents Amun, the divine energy or the God force in each of us. 
And to read these, the pyramids, you start from the outer and move toward the inner for each of the dimensions of optimal health. The framework is to first make a choice. Make a choice that will move you toward your greatest potential and highest good. The next level is to take an action, an action that supports this choice you've made, and to move toward your greatest potential and highest good. So optimal health is not a passive concept. It's an activist. And then finally, we'll use our feelings and observe the results of, of the actions we've taken um, to evaluate the choices that we've made. So some of the feelings that we can look for are, has this resulted in a pleasant feeling? Am I more calm as a result? Do I have more energy? Is this an alignment with my intuition? Now, there are many benefits to using this feeling indicator that we all have. Um, developing the feeling indicator and becoming more sensitive to sensations and emotions produces more choice and helps us to be less reactionary. And it also allows us to connect to the aliveness that is optimal health. Now, these steps place, I'll say it again, place the power with the individual not with any outside authority, so not a health care <coughs> practitioner, not um, a health care or sick care system, not the government, not anyone, but the individual is empowered through this system and this approach. So I'll, I'll give a couple of examples, um, not using the pyramid um, graphics that you're seeing in the book, but just one that's easier to see on the slide. So one of the choices that um, is an example that Dr. Giselle gives for optimal physical health, is to choose optimal nutrition. The action that he suggests is to eat living foods. So he suggests meeting the creator halfway and eating a diet that's at least 50% fresh, raw fruits and vegetables. These are enlivened foods. And he um, suggests in the book that the feeling indicator you'll have from this diet is increased energy. And there are several other choices and actions and feelings that he gives in the book for optimal physical health. Here's an example from optimal spiritual health, which Dr. Giselle thought was probably the most important dimension of optimal health is optimal spiritual health. So he suggests that the choice is optimal attunement. And this means that you connect with that spark of the creator with you, that you connect with the part of God that's within you and that you honor this part of God that lives in you. The action is that you relate, release to the creator, and this means that you turn over your ego to the direction of God. And the feeling that we can expect from the, continually making this choice is joy. Now, another... Um, very essential tool that Dr. Giselle frequently talked about was to ask empowering questions. And this is a characteristic of the vibrant and alive intellect that is optimal intellectual health. So you ask yourself, is this going to help me toward my greatest potential and highest good? So when faced with any choice, whether it be what to eat at a particular meal, what relationships to enter into, what um, actions to take in any area of your life, is this going to help me toward my greatest potential and highest good? Another empowering question, is this toxic? So um, often I'll use the uh, example of food. So we all know that there are foods that we love that are not good for us. <laughs> yeah. And so it uh, takes a, a, a lot of effort um, to master ourselves in that area. But the empowering questions can help because we can ask ourselves, is this going to help me toward my greatest potential and highest good? Is this toxic? How am I going to feel after I eat it? Will uh, choosing something else um, give me more energy, more pleasant feelings in my body? Or will this increase my energy level? So the empowering question is a tool that we can constantly use to master ourselves and our energy. Um, 
I, I wanted to give another example um, because it kind of it ties into Dr. Erskine's talk about um, removing the boot <laughs> from our necks <laughs> because um, this the pyramids of power approach is a way to remove the boot. It gives us the individual power to do that, and not with anger because anger is actually a toxic emotion. And so Dr. Giselle proposed that this is why forgiveness is an essential um, aspect of optimal spiritual health. Because forgiveness allows us to free ourselves. It's not about the perpetrator. Um, responding with anger and violence always harms the perpetrator. So this is why we suggest that forgiveness is a, a more optimally healthy approach because it supports our own health, our own highest potential and greatest good. Now, to address health disparities, people must be educated to take charge of their health. He suggests that we achieve equity through empowerment, not by making people reliant on outside authorities. So this is an approach that takes optimal health also beyond preventive and alternative medicine because it focuses the individual on her greatest potential and highest good instead of only average, average health or the mere absence of disease. And the pyramids of power approach can also be a collective practice of building power for communities. Um, it's a tool for those of us in the healing or healing professions or community advocates. This is a quote from Dr. Cicel. He says that we'll be much more effective therapists and you can substitute teachers, community organizers, any of the professions that work with people. We'll be much more effective therapists as we include optimally healthy life force choices in the treatment regimens that we advocate for our patients and model in our own lives. So this is about life force choices, strengthening and empowering that spark of the creator in each of us. He says modern technology and scientific medical research continues to confirm the ancient truths that in Hotep knew 5,000 years ago. What we eat, absorb, eliminate, affirm, and actualize through our knowledge of self and nature, determines the quality of our lives. Now, Dr. Chiselle recognized that optimal health is not easy. It is a lifelong practice. It's not something that's accomplished in a day, a week, or a year. Um, he recognized that you'll be met with resistance. You'll face challenges along the path. especially as you first begin to um, transition away from a toxic lifestyle. But the way to deal with this um, resistance and other challenges is to use them for training to gain strength. But similar to the way that weightlifting is used to build muscular <coughs> strength. Now, the ethical foundation of, pyramid, of the Pyramids of Power approach is love. It's a guiding principle that assures we will honor and respect ourselves and others. And Dr. Chiselle put it this way. So he said that directing our energy toward growing into our greatest potential and highest good is called self-love. He said that using our life energy to enhance the life energy of other living things is called love for others. And then directing our energy toward enhancing the lives of others without placing judgment on who deserves our energy is called unconditional love. Mm -hmm. Now, I propose that reconciliation and reparations starts with each of us. We have to claim our power as a necessary first step. We must claim our well-being and our joy. So Pyramids of Power is about having a fully optimal life, about having joy, about having a vibrant and energized body, 
about having a vibrant intellect, an enhanced relationship with the divine. It's not about sacrifice. It's not about doing without what we want. It's about having a life we love. Thank you very much. Responded, which is Dr. Rubin, who is a professor of bioethics and director of the National Center for Bioethics and Research in Health and Healthcare <clears throat> at Tuskegee University. Prior slash current adjunct appoint, appointments, professor of public health, medicine, and ethics. Entered the nominational theolo theological center, clinical professor, Department of Community Health, Preventive Medicine, Morehouse School of Medicine. Professor, Department of Behavioral Sciences and Health Education, Emory's Rowland School of Public Health Professor, School of Dentistry and Graduate Studies, Meharry Medical College, Dr. Warren was Associate Director of Minority Health, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Associate for Urban Affairs, Agency for Toxic Substances and Registry, and Associate Director for Environment Justice. He directed Infrastructure Development National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. National Institute of Health. Formerly, he was the Dean of Schools of Dentistry, Meharry Medical College. Now, welcome to Dr. Rubin. I'm just going to switch from uh, the academic, I mean the administrative role I've been playing throughout this 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 uh, this week, along with Dr. Hodge, to more of a programmatic or an academic role uh, in responding to uh, Attorney Shazelle. The first couple of things that before I started, I was clear about. Yesterday, I was not really clear about when I was talking about the how this area, how about super trial and their. Uh, lawsuit. Uh, if I if you misinterpret me saying that their history was stolen, uh, then that's not that's not correct. Um, somebody brought it to my attention. So I went I went back to the library online and I actually pulled up an article that um, kind of capitalized uh, what actually happened. Uh, in addition we actually invited one of the, the uh, women from that tribe to Tuskegee a couple of years after I got here to really hear the story so we could get it straight. I was also particularly bothered because the federal government funded Arizona State. CDC actually funded before I got here, but nonetheless, they funded them, so I was particularly bothered by that. Uh, it says uh, the article, the American Medical Association Journal of Ethics, says in 1989, Members of a small tribe, possibly 650 poverty stricken people, approached ASU, Arizona State University, anthropology professor John Martin, with whom the tribe had a pre existing and trusting relationship, seeking to learn more why the incidence of diabetes, diabetes, not keeping in your mind, within the community was increasing. Genetic links to diabetes had been identified in another tribe, and in another tribe, and a similar gene could be located among the Havasupai tribe. It might provide a tool to address risk factors of the tribe. So you hear those words, risk factors, and you hear collecting genetic information. Um, that was in 1989. In 2019, there's uh, an effort in the federal government called All of Us. And their intention is to collect a million people to collect genetic samples to try to improve 
the health of every all of us. This marks to a concern that stretches back to the U.S. Public Health Service Center study, collecting data on people without their permission. Now, they were collecting data on diabetes with permission, but they used it to trace other things without permission. Collecting data, using it for one thing and saying something else. Now what they said in this article is that they were looking for mental disorders in the samples provided by the tribes. Mental disorders in samples provided by the tribes. Diabetes to mental disorders. The tribe's ancestors had crossed the foreign barrier sea to arrive in North America. They said, not the tribes, these anthropologists said. And that conflicted with some of the cultural beliefs of the tribe. Now, the Tribes had been studying and passing on traditions, but some scientists from somewhere decided they were going to use genetic material to tell a different story that they knew nothing about. And so I wanted to be clear. My intention yesterday was to be clear that it is our story that we must tell, not somebody else telling our story. And as you Share your information, be it genetic or otherwise. Be careful that the story is not the story. Who owns your blood when you give it to the American Red Cross? <coughs> what are you giving away? And what authority do they have to do something with your blood that you haven't sanctioned? point that I was making yesterday is that it belongs to you and don't give it up until you know what's going to be done. Now on to my response. I'm a um, mentee, an admirer of John Chazelle. And most folks don't even know who John Chazelle is. So when I go from, back in the day, go from conference to conference, I would uh, tell the story of John Chazelle. But y'all heard the story. Who could better tell the story than his daughter? So in my um, opening remarks, I was going to tell the story. But you heard the story in ways that I would not dare to, to say or to challenge. Let's give uh, Attorney Giselle another round of applause. In 2000, excuse me, in 1992, I was attending a convention of the National Medical Association, which is the largest um, and the only predominantly black medical society in this country. And I heard this, this gentleman, this physician, Kind of short dude talking about optimal health. And the physicians, they were there only because they had to be there. They didn't want to hear it. But they had to be there out of respect for John Chazelle. And he told them about achieving your greatest state of aliveness. And I asked you, what, what is your greatest state of aliveness? When do you feel at your best? And he said that that is optimal health, feeding your greatest state of aliveness. And I paused because I had been through an undergraduate experience with a bachelor's degree and uh, dental school experience, four more years studying health, a master's in public health, a doctorate in public health, a residency in public health, 
And I have taught at several different institutions, both here and abroad. And for those who, of you who are particularly impressed with Harvard University, I've taught at Harvard. But I had never heard about Optimal Health, ever. And I was at the CDC, the prevention capital of the world. Never heard about Optimal Health. But what I did hear about was the continual death and destruction of African Americans, Native Americans, Hispanics, and certain select groups of Asian and Pacific Islanders. But I never understood or what, heard about what to do about it. I heard about the problem. And because I've had some time in school, I understood how to research the problem. And I did. And I found out that the problem was centered not on medical care, not on health, but on disease, dysfunction, and disability. And we spend too much time on disease, dysfunction, and disability. When one says <coughs> your health, what do you see? Your death, your sickness, your disability, your dysfunction. Dr. Chazelle was very different. It was shocking. It was almost embarrassing. I had about four or five degrees. Spent a lot of time in school. I'm a real slow learner. Study hard. And never did I hear an appropriate definition of health, let alone what to do about it. So many of us who are suffering from those things don't know what to do. So we've been going to the doctor. And I'm a dentist, so the same thing happens in, in my profession. So you go and you ask about your disease. And most doctors, if they have their weight in knowledge or in wealth, they can tell you what to do about your disease. But if you ask, that has to do about what your health needs, different paradigm. <laughs> have you ever asked them, what is health? What, 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 what is health? When somebody says, define health, what, what, what comes to your mind? Disease, dysfunction, premature death. So Dr. Chazelle was talking something different. So I just started following him around. He'd go to a place in New York, I'd be there. Go to a place in, this, in this DC, I'd be there. Nashville, I'd be there. So I did that for about five years. And then he said, well, young man, I'm the young man then. <laughs> Why are you following me around? I said, I don't know. <laughs> what, what do you want? I don't know. What can I do? And what the answer was, I don't know. So we began to engage in, in this process of understanding what I needed, not even what I wanted. And what we were able to do is operationalize optimal health. Because as you saw, it's a conceptual framework. But how does that translate into what we do? And I won't go through those different parts of optimal health. But just remember, it is a journey, not a destination. Mm -hmm. It is a journey that you must engage in every single day. Mm -hmm. Founded on dimensions <coughs> that Giselle clearly points out. Dimensions of your health, and what he also said, it is grounded in the people you want to serve. So don't look for optimal health in a population that has nothing to do with you. He grounded his philosophy in the people he served in Baltimore. And many of them look like me and you. That was the foundation for optimal health. My studies was looking at somebody else and their health status and trying to find optimal health in them. What Giselle said was, 
It starts with you and your greatest state of aliveness so that you can achieve your highest potential and do your greatest good. And I raise with you, what is your highest potential and what is your greatest good? What is your, not mine, highest potential and your greatest good? And I would argue that you haven't reached it because you may not even know what it is. Dr. Chazelle said, as his daughter so clearly articulated, that normal blood pressure is not your blood pressure. It's not what you should be striving for, because you know, blood, normal blood pressure has changed, hasn't it? it? Used to be 180, well, what is it, Doc, back there? What's normal blood pressure? Okay, now that changed. It's going to change again, because the norm changes. So he said, not normal, but optimal. What ought to be, Dr. Giselle? Whatever it is, if you call it normal, it ain't optimal. <laughs> Hear that? So after those five years, I started inviting Dr. Giselle to go with me. After I followed him around for about five years. And I had a little budget, so I'd take him here and take him there. And um, the most wonderful experience was when I took Dr. Chazelle with me to Harvard. Because they need to hear that. They need to hear about optimal health. And he was just like he was in Baltimore. Without apology, without hesitation. Tremendous courage. All the Harvard professors were listening to optimal health and could not argue theoretically what optimal health ought to be. So you've heard it. What ought to be? So what he left me with, because quite frankly, when your father made his transition, I was at a convention. He was at Mary, 50th year anniversary. And I got a call that said that Dr. Giselle has made his transition. I don't know where I was, but about a week later, I was in Baltimore at his memorial service. And folks came from out the walls to honor John Chazelle. And what I said to him, and I've said to many of you, that I am carrying on the legacy of John Chazelle, translating optimal health theoretically into optimal health practically. And as she has said, as a charge to you on what you're going to do. And let me give you some tools on what optimal health translates into what you do, not tomorrow, but right now. I'm going to read it so I won't get it twisted. Dr. Giselle talks about optimal health as a thing for us to do collectively. What should we do? And he's given those principles, intellectual, emotional, physical, socioeconomic, and spiritual. And I hope you heard the foundation for all of it is spiritual. The foundation. And so what we try to do is translate that theoretical construct for all of us into what you ought to do for you. And I seldom tell folk what they ought to do, but I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> Call those principles of health promotion. And that drives the question of what is health? Health is your physical, social, psychological, and spiritual well-being. Not just you, but in your group, in your physical and social environment. What does that mean? That means you can't be healthy by yourself. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, when you're not healthy, you can tell somebody, I don't feel good. I got a headache. My stomach's hurting. My back's hurting. I can't walk. <laughs> but when have you last told somebody, I'm feeling good? Huh? When have you told somebody about something about your health, not your disease? Tell me, do you know anything about your health right now? 
Not your disease. I don't want to hear that. What about your health right now? Think about it. You may not have any idea what your optimal health ought to be or your current health ought to be. Struggle with that. Figure out something about your health. In fact, instead of saying how bad is it, the question is how good is it? But let me give you some guidelines from which to measure your health. Eating the right food. Mm -hmm. do, do, you, do you know what that means? <laughs> what about eating some bad food? You know what that means? <laughs> huh? Well, I don't want you to talk about that bad food, but the good food. Talk about the good food, not that you know it, but that you're eating it. Huh? Nutrition and diet. And there's a difference between nutrition and diet. In Tuskegee, we're in a food desert. That's insane. A Tuskegee in the food desert. Eating the right food. That's one principle. Second one is taking care of your body. You know how to do that? I didn't say go to the doctor. I mean, everybody needs a good physician and a good dentist. But taking care of your body. Let me give you three guidelines, three principles. Hygiene. Hmm? Exercise. And rest. Rest. How many hours of sleep did you get last night? Six. How many you suppose that had? How much water did you drink yesterday? How much should you drink? Now, I'm not telling you stuff you don't already know, but I'm highlighting the stuff that you should be doing or ought to be doing optimally. Getting along with others. Let me translate that. Interpersonal violence. Something's happening. Every, every, somebody's getting killed every day. Unnecessarily. Interpersonal violence. Social skills that prevent harm. Getting along with others. Just saying good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. I lived in Nigeria for a while and they're real clear about good morning at a certain time, good afternoon at a certain time, and good evening. Just so you stay woke. If you talk about good evening at 5 o'clock in the morning, you ain't woke. <laughs> but intentional about separating the morning from the afternoon from the evening. So I started saying good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, not just hello. Hello has no real meaning. It's not contextualized. Think about it. Good morning. Good afternoon and good evening. Getting along with others. Protecting and respecting the environment. We're in the midst of insanity right now. There's no climate change, they say. Huh? There's no global warming, they say. But it's nice outside right now. It's either it may be raining, and tomorrow it may be snowing. So to say that there's no such thing as global warming is simply insanity. Protecting and respecting the environment. Protecting and respecting the environment. And believing in a divine order to the universe. Everything's in perfect order. Now what happens is that we get it out of order. We think we can fix things that are not even broken. <laughs> protecting and respecting the environment. And that's really in spiritual grounding, something bigger than your eye. So what I want you to, to, to separate Dr. Chazelle's global, general, large constructs of optimal health to specific things that you can do. And those things are accountable to who? To you. And you know what not to do. And I'm suggesting that you translate what you ought to be doing for what you're currently doing. Now that's the optimal health framework from big to small to what you can do. 
And think about how much of that requires you to go and see a physician, to go and see a dentist. How much it requires you to go and see those folks, as important as they are. Everybody deserves to have a good primary care physician, no doubt about it. But the principles are beyond the control of any health care provider. And I hope you heard earlier that it's within your locus of control. How much of it, of it do you take care of? Now, Chazelle's work, which really is powerful, is being discovered, if you will, by others. So you see in the literature, optimal health, and it's not connected with John Chazelle which is an ethical violation. I've read it many times, and other people have even coined it as if they did it. But I declare, and you should too, optimal health started with John Chazelle. So when you hear that word, even at the center of here, we don't use a little old and little age. We use a big old and a big age. It's a way of being. It's a way of being. This notion of Spirituality is a part of the health paradigm. It's something that we have been wrestling with, and Dr. Giselle gave us a framework from which to use it. Spiritual health, spiritual well-being, something bigger than you. Now, I'm not talking about religious health, or religious but something bigger than you. And if you don't understand that there is something bigger than you, you're in more trouble than you might think. Optimal health is the way to go. And what should Dr. Chazelle help me to learn is that it's okay to be a little different. I learned that being a vegetarian was okay. I stopped telling folk. I just said, I, I just, I'm not gonna, I, I, no thank you. I, I, don't, I don't want that. But after working with him, and he, he, he wouldn't would carry water in, in a plastic, he had a bottle. And so I thought I was doing okay until I met up with Dr. Chazelle. And so if you think you're doing okay, then get the book. And more importantly, I think we've given you most of the book. Read it. You can't get it on Amazon. You can? We tried. It's on Amazon. It's on Amazon now. You're going to go through a third party. So it's on the platform. I went and looked it up, but you got to go through a third party. No, it's so there. it's there. Okay, well now it's, it's, it's there now. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, so I'll have to find um, Chris Giselle. But get the book and read the book. And let me leave you with, with what I think is the most important part of this, this whole experience, that what we tried to take you through this week was a journey from 1619 to 2019. And we were intentional about each step of that journey. Started with spirituality and enslavement. We wanted to start from what we thought was the beginning. But we didn't want to stay there. We wanted to end with optimal health. And as we wrestled with it uh, and discussed it in our staff meeting, I was reminded that I know optimal health but we didn't need to stop with what I know. And we actually accepted the notion of making that our final presentation. So that was done by intention. So you don't leave with the struggles and ethics of enslavement, the struggles and ethics of spiritual, none of that. You leave with the journey toward optimal health. And I charge you with, with, with continuing that journey. But what is real clear to me is that health is, in fact, a miracle. It is divine. Mm -hmm. And it is a struggle that we must engage in every day and every minute. Mm -hmm. And it's more than just your physical well-being. It's more than your social well-being. Mm -hmm. It's much more than any of that. Your health is really a miracle. Mm -hmm. It's a miracle. And, and, and I, I believe in miracles. I don't know about you. Yes. Yes. You know, y'all got here this morning, some kind of way. Did, did you control that? You were on the bus, but the bus got here by a toll much bigger than you. Matter of fact, somebody you flew in, right? Uh, on a plane. 
Did you control that? Uh, what, but even more fundamentally, you, you woke up this morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, did you control that? No. The, the folks say, I woke up this morning, what in my clothes in my right mind? Mm -hmm. did, did you control that? No. I would call that a miracle. Mm -hmm. The fact that particularly folks who look like you, all of you, regardless of your, of your race, your ethnicity, your gender, your sex, your orientation, your education, your income, any of that, uh, you, you, you're a miracle. And how did you get put together like you put together? I'm a dentist. And you were born with, with by the time you're two years old, you got 20 teeth. You don't control that unless you mess it up. When you get to be an adult, you have 32. You don't control that unless you mess it up. You got two legs, two arms, two eyes. Not three legs, not four eyes, consistently. That's perfection. Do you control that? No. But you can mess it up. And I'm suggesting that all that we see before us is perfection, unless we messed it up. You are a miracle unless you mess it up. Think about it. What are you doing to mess it up? Don't say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> but you are a miracle. And I want you to appreciate the miracle that you are and the miracle that you are sitting beside. So turn to your neighbor and just tell them you're a miracle. <laughs>
let's hear it from you. Hello. Um, <coughs> um, so with optimal health and trying to get people to uh, be the greatest potential for their uh, so that they can achieve the greatest good. And we have a sick care system in America and it's based off of profit and breaking in money. Do you think that the mainstream uh, physicians would actually adopt this type of mentality or do you think that it's so ingrained that they, even if knowing the information, they'll still refuse it? Well, I think that there has been some um, progress in the medical field, but not a lot. But that, that's why Dr. Chiselle advocated for you taking responsibility and not relying on this health care, the sick care system. So I think it really is a truly revolutionary act to take charge of your own health. And that is the message that he was trying to get through. So, Black Lives Matter, but yes, are you, do you really believe that if you're putting toxic food in your body, if you're sedentary, if you're not um, take, being empowered for your own health? So I, I think the primary message is that it starts with you and, um, and it, it can flow out from there. So Dr. Giselle was very um, focused on educating other physicians about optimal health, and I think that that's part of the charge to physicians is to take charge of their own health, become more empowered, um, pursue optimal health, and then it can spread from there. But really it starts with each of us. We, we have a duty to honor this spark of the creator in us, and we're not if we're not pursuing optimal health. 85% of your health has nothing to do with health care. 85%. So if you take care of the 85%, then you, 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 you get the check. But we have some young physicians here. What, what are your thoughts about responding to optimal health? How many young docs? Okay. Um, the preventive medicine residents, is that right? Absolutely. Yes. Okay, so you should be at the head of the game on optimal health. Again, um, my name is Gino Francois. I'm a beef all been here fellowship with you all for the past two, three days. Uh, so as you pointed to, uh, uh, I, I am receiving training in preventive medicine. Uh, as the name suggests, you're doing preventive, suggests that you're doing whatever you can to keep someone out of the hospital or clinic uh, system. Uh, um, within the preventive medicine, there's this concept that's called lifestyle medicine. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but I would say lifestyle medicine, through my uh, lenses, models what I'm hearing uh, from Pyramid of Power. The idea behind lifestyle medicine is this. Uh, when you consider the top 10 diseases of what's killing people in this country, even in the top five, heart disease, cancer, stroke, what have you, most of those, if not all of them, are rooted in our behaviors or health behaviors. A behavior that you choose is a reflection of your lifestyle. Your lifestyle is a reflection of the choices that you make every day. And so recognizing that pretty much our behaviors are driving us to our, our, our early deaths or demise, it, it, it takes into account that why don't we address the lifestyle instead of just focusing on the uh, medical interventions. In a sense, your lifestyle can become the medicine versus having to kind of depend mostly on uh, the medical system, um, pharmaceuticals and things like that. And so I subscribe to that idea, to that philosophy uh, of lifestyle medicine, and so kind of to respond to you and, and to kind of uh, echo uh, you as well, attorney uh, Chis Chisel, is that this idea of lifestyle medicine, it's relatively young compared to the mainstream um, thinking, um, but there is a growing movement uh, and recognition, not only amongst physicians, but it's very multidisciplinary, including nurses, uh, pharmacists, uh, nutritionists, and, um, uh, nurses, and I've said that already, but pretty much it's just this idea that we're recognizing that 
what our current or conventional medicine is offering, is that's not totally what it's at. And I agree, uh, Dr. Warren, uh, health, uh, I, I wasn't aware of that statistic, but health, 85% of it, is, it's not medicine. It's, 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 I personally have termed this definition that health is your resiliency towards death. And that encompasses everything that we've talked about, um, social, well, uh, spiritual, physical, um, and, um, and mental as well. And so that's just um, my response. I hope that um, gives some clarity. Did you guys want to comment as well? Let me make a quick comment about that, because I think it's important to shift on the journey. Consider life circumstance as well as lifestyle. Because so many of the things that uh, keep us from being healthy are out of our specific locus of control. So the lifestyle is within your locus of control many times, but life circumstances are not. So push the paradigm a little further, but that, that's growth and we appreciate it. Uh, the community, um, I just, this is more of a comment, and so I am the someone who yesterday uh, had the discussion with Dr. Warren about the Arizona State University versus the Havasu Pai Tribes um, case, and I just wanted to thank you for uh, clarifying and going back and learning, and it's so important that um, we get things right, and it's really important that we understand which stories are ours to tell and which, which um, times it is our duty to make a space for people to tell their own stories. And so um, I really appreciate you going back and clarifying things for today. And uh, my, yeah, and I'm then also what my question was going to be was alluding to the circumstances that you're born into, right? And so, like, you. It's really hard when you're in a food desert and you're working, you know, 80 hours a week. When are you so, and you have a family to care for? When are you supposed to go to the gym or pay for that gym membership or you know get out and eat healthy? And so it's like, how do we create a system um, via policy and uh, law changes and things like that, so that way people can have the opportunity to be empowered to um, take charge of their own health. Let me thank you for uh, helping me to, uh, encouraging me to go back to the literature again and clear it up. I, I um, really learned from young folk. And I learned to listen. And when you listen, you'll hear. But, you know, um, oftentimes we're not listening to the real answer. So uh, I did what you asked me to do, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, have either one of y'all, I'm not sure if this is the title of this book or not, but it's called um, Eat Right for Your Type. And everybody has a blood type, and there's certain foods you're supposed to eat according to your blood type. Like my husband, he passed away with pancreatic cancer at 56. And so his blood type, I think, was type A or something, mine's his type O. And um, he would eat everything that was wrong. Uh, well, not everything, but he was eating a lot of stuff that was wrong. Like, he was a person that liked the barbecue. So they said that, you know, when you cook meat and that fat that drip off that meat into the charcoal, you know, that comes to toxic. So basically, you know, he did a lot of that. I mean, he was a caterer. So um, not only he didn't eat right, he didn't take care of his body, like alcohol, cigarette smoking. Um, you know, he had all the signs and symptoms of pancreatic um, cancer, but his doctor didn't do what was should have been done for prevent preventive health. Like, you know, he if somebody got risk factors, you need to test them. Okay, he had to go to another doctor to be tested, you know, for the pancreatic cancer. Because this sneaks up on you. He had all the risk factors except for pancreatic cancer. I mean pancreatitis. The risk factors are male, being black, alcohol, smoking, um we didn't know he had a history of pancreatic, uh, I mean, uh, 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 pancreatic uh, cancer until I think last year or sometime this year, his grandmother, his mother's mother passed away with pancreatic cancer. So that's why it's so important for everybody to know their history. That's why the questionnaire tell you, ask you these questions. What is your history? What is your family history? Everybody got something in their family. So you need to stop being quiet about stuff and let people know what's going on in your family so you can get checked out and see 
if you have some of the same things that's going to happen to your family. And when my, my son found out about this counselor, he doesn't have a counselor policy. <laughs> you know, but he don't do all the things that his dad did. So my, my son basically is vegan, and I pretty much have turned towards that type of diet. Until I kind of got stuck when I came here. <laughs> I got saved on my day. I ate some chili, and I knew that was the perpetrator. So my diet just been out of sight since I've been here, but I'm going to get on the right track. You know, but... um. You know, we do need to be proactive about our health. And, um, and uh, many years ago, I found out through going through research, you know, um, I was going to um, do research on um, a medication that treats um, pulmonary hypertension. They're going to test you, you know, from your head to your toes, you know. So that's a free physical, okay? So the results were that my nose enzymes elevated. So, okay, they let me go ahead and do the study though. Um, so later on, you know, people are always doing, you know, health care. So I went on, you know, kept having my blood tested, you know, still elevated the time. So I went to see the doctor, and UT some question in Dallas, they do a lot of cancer studies, they do research. So they had me on this diet. Lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, special diet. They ruled out fatty liver disease. So basically, they ruled out fatty liver disease, but nobody could tell me why I'm still having liver enzymes, but I'm not a drinker. I have an alcoholic liver, but I don't even drink. So thank God I wasn't a person that loved alcohol. But um, the bottom line is, though, since I've been on this special diet, this vegan diet, though, it's been helping my liver enzyme pay. Basically, they're almost normal. And I thank God for that. So, so everybody can be proactive and, and get on the bandwagon with trying to get your health in check. You know, some things you can't, you know, avoid. Like my daughter has type 1 diabetes. Nobody in that family has type 1 diabetes. You know, it's an autoimmune disease. That's something that well, couldn't be prevented. You know, lupus. There's a lot of diseases that can't be prevented. You know, it just come on with birth, being born. So, but the other things you can control though. You control what goes into your mouth. Yeah. So be, you know, just I'm just telling you, be proactive and get your blood pressure checked. Because at my church, every month uh, when I was teaching, the students, I would bring them to the church and we would take people blood pressures and people be like, don't want to come. A lot of men. Oh, it's okay. They come over there, they're scared. But a lot of times, though, their blood pressure be elevated, they wasn't even aware. And one lady just recently told me that I didn't even know that she had had her blood pressure checked by the students because I, I don't be around them a lot of times when they're testing people. And they said, I found out my blood pressure was elevated through your students. And I just looked at her and smiled. She said, no, nah, I'm taking medication and doing better. Mm -hmm. let, let me make a small comment to that, that wonderful story. Th think about health and not disease. Don't, you know, not, not how to prevent disease. Think about health. What do I need to do to be helpful and not to not be sick? It's a, it's a major shift in your thinking. It may not be a shift in your behavior, but it's a major shift in your thinking. What do I need to do to be healthy? Hi, um, good morning. I'm Celia as you gave. I've spoken before, but I'm one of the preventive medicine residents from the area. Um, I just wanted to comment. Uh, Gino did a very great job, Dr. Francois, of describing uh, what lifestyle medicine is and its importance in our communities and how we can really implement that. Um, one of the things I wanted to just kind of piggyback on with this statement, and also what you spoke on to Dr. Warren and Attorney Giselle, was the need for self empowerment. I think um, you're absolutely right when you say that circumstance can limit your ability to have an optimal lifestyle. But I think one of the things that we need to do is empower ourselves to recognize the ways that we can work in these confines that we have. And you know, many of us here that are sitting here are fortunate enough to be able to take the time to participate in a session like this. So we may not be the exact audience I'm referring to, but we have the voice to speak to people who will utilize the resources that we'll give them. And one of the things that I tell my patients is to be able to cook for yourself. Um, and the cooking 
oftentimes the barriers that people report are the cost of food and being able to use fresh foods and, so, and say that that's a limiting factor. I understand that, especially being a resident with two kids. Money can be tight, but being able to recognize how to make use of what you have, using, even if it's frozen vegetables, using those things and knowing how we can actually impart that skill set to younger generations. You know, I, I learned to cook from my mother. It's not because I, you know, sat down on Food Network and was whooping up things, and also learning to cook from a person who knows how to make the best of the resources that they had. So I don't cook from the perspective of spending $300 on a meal. I can make use of the small funds that I have and make that stretch. And I think it's important as a community that we teach each other these skills because these are the things that keep us healthy. I'm also of Nigerian descent, and I recognize too that cooking and the things that we do in our home are what build community. And they build, they are part of your heritage and a part of your story. We've also had to learn in my home how to cook more healthfully. So palm oil is something that we use, you know, it's been a lot of the recipes, swapping that out for bell peppers. It gives you the same color, it's healthier, thinking of different creative options that we can use to build ourselves and also within our community. So that's all I just wanted to say. I don't want to label, belabor that idea, but just the goal of empowerment really is, is crucial through food. The, um, the circumstances, like communities that are food deserts, um, and those sort of circumstances that we say we don't have control over. But if people are educated to know what's healthy, what sort of foods that we should have, then we can collectively raise our voices, and theoretically, the market will respond. You know, and we can, if if we're saying this is what we want, we want access to fresh fresh fruits and vegetables then hopefully the market can respond. But we have, that's part of being empowered is that we state what we need instead of just accepting chips and soda. Hi, my name is Nina Hilton. Um, thank, I do want to thank you both a lot for sharing. Is it? Is it something else? No. Okay. Um, so, I wanted to comment on um, emotional health, uh, which was one of the aspects that attorney uh, Chazelle introduced. And um, I just, I'm just wondering, do we sometimes have to sacrifice our desire for optimal health in the name of justice? Um, and I was reminded of a James Baldwin quote that says, to be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a state of, in, to be enraged almost all the time. Um, and I think that in some respect, anger has been an important part of activism. Um, and so I'm just wondering what your responses to that would be. Um, is there ever circumstances where we do have to kind of compromise when it comes to optimal health? Or is it even possible for everyone to be at the optimal health level? That, that's a really excellent question. And I would say emphatically, no, we, there are not circumstances where we have to sacrifice optimal health. So, of course, we are justified in our anger. Yes, if you're not angry or not paying attention. But being stuck in anger, which is a toxic emotion, instead of allowing it to pass through, and then we take action toward the positive, we don't want to be stuck in toxicity. So it's the next step. We've, um, we've got uh, at least a century of excellent um, scholarship on the problems, and we, but we must pay equal attention to the solutions. You know, so, so much of disease, the research is now showing, is the result of emotional states. Stress, anger, and related um, negative emotions. So we, have, we must, it's imperative that we address our emotional health. And, that, and it's, it's very tied, Dr. Giselle said, it's almost that the emotional health and the spiritual health are so closely tied. So no, of course we are going to be angry. But are we going to stay stuck in that, let it fester in the body, or are we going to let it move through and focus on how to move toward health? So that's the revolutionary act. 
is where we move past that and move toward our own health and we advocate for our own health. That's the revolutionary act in my opinion. It, it is one of translation, you know, go from anger to even. And and there are tools to get even. And so don't 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 be stuck. Uh, Dr. Chazelle says stress is okay. Distress is not. So we're in a state of stress, but let's not let it go to distress. And the things we can do and must do to prevent that from happening. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Lily Head, and I'd like to thank both Dr. Uh, Attorney Chazelle and Dr. Warren for the conversation um, and the information. I, when I was teaching, I was teaching health, and I taught my students that 84% of um, their health was in their hands. So thank you for reinforcing that, and that has been over 20 years ago. But I'm wondering though, and then I, I, um, <clears throat> meant I, I taught them that 16% uh, of the balance was environmental, things that they did not have control over, and of course, um, birth. I didn't hear too much conversation about the environmental impact on optimum health today. And I was just wondering um, why. So um, I think the only reason why is because I had 30 minutes. <laughs> so I wanted to hit the most important points. But um, my full-time work is with climate change. So I, I absolutely recognize the importance of environmental health and environmental justice. And these are things more that, that we, um, these are things that we more work on collectively as a collective body. So um, I, I, it's absolutely imperative that, that's one of the um, ancient African principles that Dr. Giselle focuses on is the connection with nature and um, how we have to honor nature. And nature provides the best climate solutions, um, by the way. So um, I agree um, environmental health is extremely important. So um, does, that, does that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, it answered the question because you didn't have the time. Oh, so yeah, it's important. <laughs> I tried to focus on some um, key relatable points, but um, Yes, it's equally important. All of, it's an entire system, that, that pyramids of power system of optimal health. And it, they're, all the parts are interconnected, interrelated. So um, I read pyramids of power. <laughs> There's a lot of great information that I couldn't even begin to touch on in the time that we have today. Good the, the, the environment is where we live, work, play, and worship. Mm -hmm. So inherently, all that you do with optimal health is in context of the environment. Mm -hmm. So we didn't say it because it's a part of the, being in harmony with the environment as opposed to trying to control it. So you're absolutely correct. Good morning. Go ahead. I am Amy Pack, and I'd like to thank you all for your excellent presentations today. Um, I have a comment, first of all. I was a former patient of a physician who truly believed in preventive health. He had incorporated in his practice a nutritionist, fitness instructor, psychologist, psychiatrist. He tried to stay away from uh, just giving his patients, being a pill pusher, so to speak. And everybody in his practice, we often talked about things that began to really normalize. The diabetics were stabilized, the hypertensive patients were stabilized. However, unfortunately, and he had even set up a gym in the back of his office so you could go and exercise at the end of the day. However, he had to close his practice. And this is the only physician I can truly say that I've ever cried over uh, when he closed it. And he said that he had to do it because when he billed the private insurances, they would not reimburse him for those services for the to go. So that was a real disadvantage. So my question is, and that as the physicians move towards preventive health, 
in their practices? Will there be a form of reimbursement so that they won't have to close like my physician did? I've got a comment on that in a way. I don't want to interrupt Kevin uh, online, but there are some efforts to make sure that hey, physicians are uh, thank you. There are some efforts that are being put in place to make sure that uh, physicians do address some of the bigger health issues, not as not as uh, sophist not in as sophisticated manner as your doctor was doing, but we we will be getting better reimbursements for patients that are healthy. So if the patient's able to maintain certain blood pressure um, ranges, if the patient is able to maintain better HbA1c's or your marker of diabetes, that's actually. Um, going to be, there are talks of that being rewarded, I guess, or compensated within the new pair uh, system. But if it, it's not, I don't think it's ever going to be to the extent, well, at the, at the moment, it's not to the extent that it should be, but it's almost even at a penalty to the physician if they're not making sure that there are things in place to track that. And a lot of times now at Meharry, for instance, most of our quality improvement measures um, that we have to do as residents and even in the medical room and in the hospital center on decreasing the number of days that patients stay in the hospital while they're admitted, as well as also making sure that we are tracking um, diabetes, high blood pressure on our patients. And so if you're doing that, that actually improves the funds that come back to the institution. Um, so like I said, it's not to the extent that your doctor, which was doing, it sounds like he's doing an excellent job with, but there are some things in place to uh, to work with that. And, and a lot of that comes from the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. So hopefully, if that stays in place, we should see further improvements based on the um, initiatives that were set out uh, at the outset. Dr. Shadella is in this place, and what he would say, if you're talking about a sick care system, not a health care system, and the sick care system will not reward you for being healthy. It ain't gonna work. It ain't gonna work. You need a good doc. I'm not suggesting that. Go there, know what you're going there for, and know when you get it, and get the hell out of it. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just want to again thank you all and thank the audience for all of this is immersive personal sharing um, about where we are and sort of the ways and the approaches to optimal health. Um, and there's a couple things that I actually want to throw out through my own, through the medical history course and really trying to get students to understand this. One is that we have lost now about two to three generations of cooks. So that's important for us to think about that for some people they don't know the difference between kale or collard or all these various things. So that's the first thing I want to throw out. The other thing is we are privileging those outside of prison, so we're not thinking about right now, I feel like the conversation does not lend itself to prison health, and then those who may come out going in and out of prison, because again, we don't think about that, I mean, we think about the psychological, but then how just the lived experience, and I bring that up because my father, who had gotten out of prison three years ago, he had a heart attack, he died a, a, a year ago, whereas most people in hearing that will reduce him to, oh, he must have been unhealthy, and then yet really looking at a heart that survived prison, two terms in fact. Mm -hmm. So I want to throw that out there. And then the last thing is sexual behavior. We have high sexual behavior now. So we're thinking about optimal health. Then we have to look at empowerment. So it becomes almost idealized that eat right, think right, but yet the daily sort of even more the social, we're looking at the young and how they're just behaviors in that way. So any one, all of it that you all can speak to, I think really, that is bringing it now present and where we're going, because we're gonna have even more, I think more challenges in the future. So either or both of you can speak to that, that would be extremely helpful. Um, I would say read Pyramids of Power. <laughs> um, Dr. Giselle does um, address some of those issues. And also, yes, we have a lot of work to do to get this philosophy implemented. We have a lot of work to do, but what we need to do is focus on you know, what we need that can move us toward optimal health. So rather than um, focusing, for example, on more pharmaceuticals and more access to pharmaceuticals, we focus on more access to mental health care, um, fresh foods, fresh organic foods, et cetera. 
So I, I don't mean to oversimplify because it's not simple what we the work we need to do, but I think as a the guiding philosophy that we can have is simple. And again, it, it, it's a force of habit of the system that we're in, but we, we're still not talking about health. We're talking about disease, dysfunction, and even health care. And there, that's the limiting conversation. So think about health and struggle with it and figure out how you're going to operationalize health for you and then see how that can be generalized. Just as the side with the, 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 the prison system, the prison health care system is much better for those who are low income than those who are on the outside. So some folks get better health care in prison because that's, that's by law. So it, it, but that's again a health care conversation or a disease conversation. This conversation about optimal health is about health, which is something we have not talked about in any collective way. So I, I did think of an example. There are some programs for, to bring meditation into prisons, and that is a hugely impactful and help generating practice that is a, that can be available to anyone even incarcerated so um, you know yes there are things that we can do you know meditation is available for free to everyone and it has research is all the current research is showing the multiple health benefits of meditation so that's just as one example and it's in the book <laughs> I heard an incident going back years ago when I was trying to figure out when my mother, she fell, she broke her leg. So she told me to go out and get some uh, red clay and mix it up with some vinegar and bring it back to me. So I did that after, okay. So she pasted the red clay with the vinegar and made a cast around her leg. And she put white material around it. Two weeks later, she took it off and she didn't laugh. I said, what? So, and an incident happened to me. I had, the doctor wanted me to uh, have two new knee replacements. So I thought about that. And they wanted me to have uh, a bad disc in my back. So I learned from my mother what I used to do when my back was bad. I, I lay on the floor. And I do exercise, push-ups, and legs back and forth, four, just four times, you know, and the pain goes away. And so I had another incident when I was in the hospital and the doctor couldn't do nothing, but I used to drink a lot of alcohol at that time. And I had liver problems. So the doctor acted like he couldn't do nothing, so I thought again. I got my mother when I, not my mother, I got my wife to go out and get me a bag of gold cell tea. And I drink that tea once in the morning, once in the afternoon, and once at night. In a couple of days, I was feeling better. And I didn't drink anything for about 20 years. And my liver is healthy now. And my back is okay too. And my knees are okay too. And that's been 20 years ago all this happened. And one more thing that I want to say that I realized one thing in the medical field that I realized that what they use today is the same thing that my mother used, but they use it with chemicals. That's what destroys people, the chemicals they use and to put in the back. That's right. That's right. Dr. Giselle, I, I almost feel uh, embarrassed to say what Dr. Giselle said with his daughter right here. But what he told me, not either or, both and. Mm -hmm. You see, if you've got a, a, not just a primary care physician, a good one, mm -hmm. then they will explore the either or or the both and. That's right. You know, I, I do acupuncture every week. Mm -hmm. I meditate every morning. But I also have a good primary care physician. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's get a hand clap for Dr. Walker. It's all keep confusing you with your last to see you have the spirit. We want to thank everyone today.
for your presence. And now we'll have Dr. Warren to come and give recognition to Attorney Jizzle. <coughs> You all know the script. You all want to go through it, but it doesn't minimize the importance of Attorney Shadell being here. All right. And the importance of the honor we pray for the Tuskegee University on something we give to somebody who's here. So she's getting the same thank you that others have gotten. And uh, not only the pen says, but the coin. I think she's heard the story. Y'all probably heard the point I want to get in. It doesn't make it any less true. I want to thank you for being here. Here's your pen set and here's your memory coin. We got it all. Now let me do this. Uh, everybody in here, it's not as many who were in here, has a post test questionnaire. Let me tell you the importance of it. We gave you the pretest to get it back, and they gave this wonderful pen that somebody took from me already <laughs> um, about 400 years. And the post test allows us to evaluate. Pretest says what you knew about this tough subject matter or the, the place when you came. The post test says, did you learn anything? And where I'm going to start, we're going to start writing our next five year uh, proposal. But that's the continuum. So we want to move to another level of evaluating what's going on here. So the critical thing about that post test is that you fill it out and we get it. So don't minimize your value. Because this is driven by what you feel and what you think. We're even doing a pretest and post test for our children from Tim's. We got to begin to do more than just have a good feeling when you come. That's important, but that's not enough. Um, we need to be able to quantify what we what we've learned, what you've learned, or not, and how to improve it. So please get your post test done. It's longer than you can send. It, 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 you probably want to do, but we need more information. We're going to refine it for our next five-year proposal. So please fill that out. It's critically important. Okay, okay and take a minute. Uh, and again, I'm. Uh, I'm going to turn back over to Dr. Fine. Uh, I got it. Uh, and the door to registration. Does everyone have a copy of the post test? Who doesn't have a post test? Uh, we have a few people. All right. <laughs> why, why Dr. Warren goes for the post test? Let me recognize Daniel Dotson. She has to step up for him, but she's back. Um, let's have a hand clap for her for her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 